This video is about celebrating the 90th anniversary of Omega's dive watches. And this year, 2022, the planet Ocean. I decided to set a challenge for myself because officially this watch hasn't been released yet. I'm doing this recording a few days before the time because next week I'm traveling, so I won't be here to talk about the watch live. So the thinking is dividing this video into two parts. First part, looking at some speculations around this design, what this watch could actually be, I don't know. Also orientate ourselves and give us some context around this ongoing competition between Rolex and Omega, creating some of the most impressive dive watches in the world. Part two will be around the actual watch, its release, its specifications. Let's frame this part of the talk around the technologies, around the innovations between these two rival brands and how these watches were created. I believe this first rivalry between Rolex and Omega began when Comex started offering contracts for these dive watches. The objective was to create one of the most capable pieces to survive in the harshest of conditions and depths. As we know, the Submariner won this competition, eventually becoming the Comex Submariner, which is now a household name. And from this early phase of development, the introduction of the helium escape valve, so we started seeing the Sea Dweller and its evolutions. It's a great piece of history and also feeds in very nicely into how Rolex adapted a lot of this technology with their Deep Sea Challenger many years later. But bear in mind also that before Rolex won the contract, it was Omega that created the real game changer, and that was the Ploprof. What made it more special and better adapted for the environments that it was going to be put into is that it was a top loader design. The case and case back was solid, the movement had to be put in through the front. Where Rolexes needed helium escape valves to clear the watch of any fine particles, the Omega Ploprof didn't require any of this technology. So in theory, we look at these two watches side by side, the Ploprof was a far better hermetically sealed design. And then around 2012, 2013, the Rolex Deep Sea Challenger was designed to accompany James Cameron as he traveled to the bottom of the Mariana Trench. Of course, we know this was first achieved in the 1950s when a Rolex also accompanied this expedition. So 50 years of difference between these watches, both equally impressive and both record breakers. Some of the most impressive features that the Deep Sea had was an internal ring lock system to keep the crystal stabilized. This watch also didn't require a helium escape valve. To compete against this in 2019, Omega created the Ultra Deep. This piece was constructed to accompany a large expedition where five of the deepest dives would be done. Of course, the main competition zone is the Mariana Trench, and there's no knowing how deep it is until you reach the bottom. It's a consistent 1,500 mile distance. And what's funny about it is that nobody knows how deep it actually gets. So it turns out when the Rolex Deep Sea Challenger reached the floor, it was the same exact depth as the Trieste that happened 50 years before. When the Ultra Deep arrived on the floor, it was a few meters further down. So technically the Omega Ultra Deep is the deepest dive watch in the world by a few meters. What's even more interesting is that in this one example, Rolex was the first to do it, Omega was the second, but they did it better. They manufactured the watch better. Why do I say this? Well, the materials they used, grade five titanium over stainless steel. It's a better metal any day of the week. Of course, they made this watch to not need a helium escape valve. The most interesting component and one of the most important features for a dive watch when it's going to those kinds of depths is the glass. Omega infused their liquid metal technology into the crystal, which meant the connection between the crystal and the case body didn't require any polymer seals. So just bear that in mind, surface on surface contact, as well as the fact that the crystal was able to endure 22 tons of direct pressure. That is insanity. You can't talk about the titanium case of the Ultra Deep without the Manta lugs. These integrated bars allowed for a strap to pass through them without any kind of interference. And this was forward thinking a few years ago. Funny enough, there is one brand that has taken this idea further forward, and that is the Tudor Pelagos FXD. It is a gorgeous piece of design, it's also very elegant, until you look to the overall thickness of the case, bearing in mind that these watches are created to travel 10,000 meters down. Also note that when the Rolex Deep Sea Challenger went down to its depth and returned, it was one trip. The Omega Ultra Deep did multiple dives like these and returned unscathed. So it's really interesting when you balance all of this out. And as the Deep Sea Challenger went on sale and became a commercial watch now known as the Rolex Deep Sea Sea Dweller, Omega has now officially released the Ultra Deep as a part of their Planet Ocean collection. This is where the speculation steps in because as I said in the beginning, I don't know what this watch is going to look like. This is not being recorded at the time of the official release date, but I'm assuming it's going to be an entire retooling of the Omega Planet Ocean line and it's going to be called the Ultra Deep. 
So this quick design exercise, I'm going to take the information that I have learned through the short teaser trailers and piece something together that I hope is going to match the proper release. Omega has said it's going to be the deepest dive watch they've ever created. It's going to be a planet ocean, but I think it will adopt the ultra deep name. This new retooling of the Planet Ocean line, I think is going to receive a full grade five titanium case, possibly a grade five titanium bracelet, maybe grade two titanium instead. Where this watch is going to shine is it's going to have a water resistance of about 1,500 meters. And if the technology is properly adapted, it won't need a helium escape crown. Other small things I am predicting is that the name and logo is going to be painted on the dial. And I'm assuming because we look to the entire sports range of Omega, the date will be at the six o'clock position. But then you get the fully applied numerals at the nine, 12 and three. I'm sticking to a colorway of black dial, black bezel. I'm also going to say that the dial and bezel are both going to be matte finished. And then hopefully if they do add a touch of color, it's going to be blue of some kind. The watch will be about 43, 44 millimeters in size and have a 15 to 18 millimeter thickness. All of the classic hallmarks and traits of the Planet Ocean line. I'm assuming it's also going to have a bigger crown on the side of the case. This idea and concept of mine, I wanted to keep simple enough that it's believable. And something tells me they're not going to deviate so far away from the brief. With all of that said, this is as far as the speculations can go. We are now going to cut a few days ahead and see what the actual watch looks like. Suffice it to say that I am extremely impressed with the release of this watch and also very surprised that it is in a way an almost literal interpretation of the original Ultra Deep. First, I'm glad that it is called the Ultra Deep and they even went to the extent of scaling all of the most important features down that defined that original watch. Very seldom do we see a company go this far and give us something that we want. The very literal reinterpretation, the model in grade five titanium is the one that I think is going to attract the most attention because it is the most faithful. It uses a fully matte black dial, black bezel. The arrangement of the typeface and the script has been excellently done. And I find what makes it such an effective design overall is that it is not offensive anywhere. Even though every element on the watch is over exaggerated for its purpose, it does still keep its identity. Then we look to the models on the bracelets and rubber straps. The bracelets have been completely reinterpreted. The case now uses an asymmetrical design where there are in fact small crown guards. The crown has been increased in size and we notice across the board that there is no helium escape crown in sight. The choice of going with a fume fade on the dial, how it goes from blue to dark on the edges is a very effective one. The brand going to the extent of creating an entirely new alloy to be debuted on a model with grand faux enamel finishing. Bearing in mind that all of these models are rated to 6,000 meters, 20,000 feet. What I really enjoy is that they haven't had to compromise in any area to get this result. The size and proportions of the case is relevant because it needs to withstand that pressure. There is also a small nod to the original Planet Ocean line with orange accents, bezel, numerals and strap. So the big question is, has this watch succeeded? And I believe it has. A success in this category, I believe, is one that manages to use the technology from past exercises implement it into a watch that is now consumer friendly. The idea that this still orientates itself around being a planet ocean with all of the elements that are clearly defined and understandable. A watch in this category that doesn't have a date complication that actually strips everything away that is unnecessary. The only critiques I have, and this is an external thing, is I don't know how I feel about the crown guard integration. I much prefer these cases when they are symmetrical. And my only other reservation are the reflective surfaces. Even though they have gone to the extent of implementing two layers of colorless anti-reflective coating, I would have preferred to have seen the entire watch, dial, bezel, numerals, matte finished. This would just further complement its function. So who's going to buy this watch? What kind of person would this piece appeal to? It is a tribute model to the deepest dive watch in the world. Could we say that as of now, it is considered one of the deepest rated commercially available dive watches. And what is the point of a watch that can survive 30 times more pressure than your body could? At the end of it all, it's simply a bragging right. But the special elements around it, though it may be grossly oversized, enlarged, it still remains true to that original identity that belongs to the Seamaster. You compare this to the watch that was made 60 years ago and the DNA is still there. What does a watch like this spell for the future of Omega's design? With the lack of elements like the helium escape crown, it might mean that further down the line, we're going to see less models with them. It shows that the brand is now trusting in the technology they have used with this flagship. And it'll mean that in the future, we might see a scaled down variant of this watch that all of us can wear. The Ultra Deep then is a proof of concept and a continuation of this competition that it now shares with Rolex. It is a standout release that I think many people will enjoy just for the sheer sake of bragging rights.
I think the percentage of people who are going to buy this watch as an only watch is very small. The idea is that a design like this complements a collection. And in the same way, Omega did this to make a statement, to prove that their technology is cutting edge. And this very well could be, from a developmental point of view, a renaissance for years to come. Was I right? Was I even close?